Thanks. So, um, in order to uh, describe particle acceleration to you, it helps to start by going back to the end of the 19th century. So, at that point, radioactivity had been discovered, but the structure of the atom was still unknown. So, about 110 years ago, Rutherford and his colleagues performed a set of scattering experiments. They took a radioactive source uh, that emitted alpha particles, and they directed those at some gold foil, and they then measured how often those alpha particles were scattered through different angles. And when they did this, they found something that was quite surprising. They found that a small but significant uh, fraction of the time, uh, the alpha particles were scattered back towards the original source through an extremely large angle. Um, and based on this, they managed to deduce that uh, the atom in internally must be made up of um, a very dense positively charged core that contains most of the mass of the atom, surrounded by a diffuse cloud of negative charge. And that, of course, is very similar to the model of the atom that we have to this day. Um, but uh, then scientists immediately had questions about what made up this, uh, this new object, the nucleus. And so in order to understand more about that, we needed access to higher energy particles. Now, one of the reasons uh, why we needed higher energies is that we're firing, for example, here alpha particles at um, another positively charged particle, and, uh, at another positively charged object, nucleus, in order to learn more about it. And so in order to get those alpha particles as close to the nucleus as possible, you need to put in a lot of energy. So the second reason why going to higher energies helps us is that um, beyond a certain energy, this allows you to create new particles in line with Einstein's equation e equals mc squared. So one way to go up to higher energies is to make use of cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are particles that are accelerated in space. They reach the Earth and uh, they collide with molecules in the atmosphere, and then they produce showers of uh, lots of high energy particles like you can see here. So they were first observed uh, by Victor Hess in 1912. You can see him in this balloon here, um, one of the balloons that he used to perform some of his cosmic ray experiments. And they were used to discover uh, the positron, the first antimatter particle that we found, and the muon, which is the heaviest sibling to the electron. So they were extremely useful tools in the early days of particle physics. But unfortunately, they're not perfect uh, tools for performing experiments. The first reason for this is that you can't control exactly when, um, when cosmic rays arrive and exactly where they go. And that means that you are limited in the precision you can achieve with cosmic ray-based experiments. The second disadvantage with them is that um, as, we, as we learned more about the structure of the nucleus, we wanted to look at finer and finer details, which again meant going up to higher and higher energies. And beyond a certain energy, uh, what, as you consider higher and higher energies, um, you find that cosmic rays arrive at the Earth at a much lower rate. And so beyond a certain energy, um, it's just not feasible to base your experiments on cosmic rays anymore. You have to build machines to accelerate the particles. So um, what, do we, what exactly do we want to do in a particle accelerator? Well, of course, we want to accelerate the particles up to high speeds and high energies, but we also need to control where they go. And the way that we do this is by applying a force, of course. Um, in particular, the Lorentz force, uh, the combined action of an electric and magnetic field on a charged particle. So if we start off looking at the first term in this equation here, the force from the, from the electric field, um, we all know probably how to set up an electric field. Um, you take two pieces of metal and you attach a voltage source to them. And then that will uh, create an electric field in the space between the, uh, the two metal plates. And positively charged particles will move in one direction, negatively charged particles in the opposite direction. And they'll be accelerated up to higher speeds and higher energies. The second term here is the action of the magnetic field. And uh, you can see here that it's got a different mathematical structure. There's that cross product in there. And the big significance of that is that the force from the magnetic field is always um, at right angles to the direction of the magnetic field and the direction that the particles are traveling in. And as a result of that, you can't use magnetic fields to change the speed of a particle, 
um, you can only use them to ch uh, change the direction that they're moving in. So based on that equation, the simplest type of accelerator uh, you might be able to think of would be one based on a constant electric field. And that's what we call an electrostatic accelerator. You take a charged particle, a source of charged particles, you put it at one end of the electric field, and they get accelerated to the other end of the field. So one of the big innovations in the development of electrostatic accelerators is this uh, voltage multiplier circuit that Cockcroft and, Walt and Walton um, devised. And um, the point of this circuit is uh, that it takes in a low magnitude um, AC voltage source and through a special arrangement of capacitors and diodes, it multiplies this up over several stages to produce a high net DC voltage. So across each of these stages, you can attach uh, metal uh, tubes and you release particles from one end of this tube, series of tubes and it will get accelerated through the electric fields between each tube. Uh, so these were used back in the 1930s uh, to split the atom for the first time, um, but they've also been used a lot since then. Um, and you can see some more modern examples here of uh, electrostatic accelerators. Um, and this one here in particular um, had a net voltage of 750,000 volts. Um, so in order to go up to higher energies to find out, um, find out more information about uh, small, finer features of particles, um, we needed to go to higher energies. And um, in order to do this, uh, the electrostatic accelerator has to provide a higher voltage. Um, and since we can only practically make these of a certain size, that means that the uh, strength of the electric field inside the machines needs to increase. The problem with this is that beyond a certain point, the electric field becomes so strong that it actually starts to ionize the materials that the accelerator is made of and the air around it, and you get a phenomenon called breakdown. So basically current flows through these uh, structures or, or the air surrounding the accelerator, and you can't use your machine as an accelerator anymore. So um, beyond a certain point, you've got to change some of the fundamental principles that your accelerator is based on. And the way you do this is to change from using a constant electric field to a time varying one. And that's the idea behind a LINAC. In a LINAC, you have a series of metal drift tubes and you attach an alternating voltage source to them. So as a particle is uh, released from a source in the first drift tube, it gets accelerated into the second drift tube. And the trick with designing a LINAC is if you, as long as you um, carefully uh, calculate the length of each of the drift tubes, then each time a particle goes through a drift tube, you can, um, you can make sure that the polarity of the voltage source has reversed. And then each time it appears from a drift tube and uh, goes towards the next drift tube in this region where there's an electric field, it will be accelerated up to higher energies. And with linear accelerators, um, if you want to go up to higher and higher energies uh, to find out more about smaller and smaller features of, of matter, then um, you can increase the voltage across any pair of these stages, or you can also add many more drift tubes in the sequence. And you can keep on doing this essentially forever, as long as you carefully calculate the length of each of the drift tubes to match the speed of the particle at that point. Um, so if you, keep on, if you um, keep on adding more stages and increasing the voltage, you eventually get to extremely large machines like the one shown here, two mile linear accelerator um, from the US. Um, and this is what it looks like inside the building. You can see this is, this is an extremely large building. Um, and it's full of extremely complicated machinery. Um, and so you might start to think this seems a bit inefficient. You've got a beam of particles traveling along here, but each of the accelerating regions in this accelerator is only seen once essentially by this beam of particles. Each, each particle only travels through any accelerating region once. Um, you might think that it would be a bit more efficient to have the particles kind of loop back round and use the same accelerating region lots and lots of times. And that's the idea behind circular accelerators. So the first circular accelerator I'll talk about is the cyclotron. 
you can see a basic sketch of one here. So you've got two um, D-shaped uh, elect metal electrodes that are hollowed out inside, uh, attached to an alternating voltage source. And then also you have a magnetic field, which is going into the board here, so just like that. Um, and then uh, you release charged particles from the gap between these two electrodes. And when you release a particle here, where it's, it's in a region of an, where there's an electric field, so it will start to be accelerated, it will start to move. Since it's moving in a magnetic field, it will move in a circular trajectory. Um, and the trick with designing a cyclotron is that as long as you choose the, uh, the frequency of this alternating voltage source, um, to carefully match the uh, strength of the magnetic field and the properties of the particle according to, uh, according to this equation. Then, um, then each time the particle is inside the hollowed out region of one of the electrodes where there is no field, um, the polarity of this source reverses so that as the particle, each time the particle crosses this gap between the two electrodes, it will be accelerated up to higher and higher energies and higher momenta. And when it has higher momentum, the particle will move in circles of larger and larger radius. So it gradually moves out to the outside of this machine. So with a cyclotron, the way you go up to higher energies is you can increase the voltage um, across this gap, um, but then you have to uh, increase the strength of the magnetic field or increase the size of this machine. Uh, to accommodate larger radius circular paths, or in practice you end up doing both and you end up with machines that look something like this. Um, so this was an extremely large cyclotron uh, that was built in Canada. You can see all of the people here involved in its construction. Um, and uh, this accelerated protons up to energies equivalent to about half a billion uh, volts. But you can see this is an extremely large machine. Um, it contains um, a magnet that's got to be extremely strong, but extremely uh, carefully calibrated across this whole volume. So you might think again, this seems a bit inefficient. Um, instead, it might be slightly cheaper to just have the particles moving along the outside edge here and just increase the strength of the magnetic field as you're accelerating the particles up to higher energies. And that's the idea behind a synchrotron. You keep the particles moving along a fixed path, which is inside a kind of donut shaped metal ring with a vacuum in it. Um, and uh, you accelerate the particles up to higher energies. And as they go to higher energies, uh, you increase the strength of the bending magnet in proportion in order to always keep them going along the same path. So you can see here a couple of photos from inside one of the largest um, synchrotrons uh, ever built, the Large Electron Positron Collider. It was built at CERN in the 80s. It accelerated particles up to um, about energies equivalent to 100 billion volts. And it was an extremely large machine, 27 kilometers circumference. Um, around the same time, another large uh, synchrotron was being built in the US. Um, this was slightly smaller, only 6.8 kilometers circumference. Uh, but it accelerated particles up to about 10 times the energy of LEP. And then the highest energy acceleration in the world is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, it's built in the same 27 kilometers circumference uh, tunnel as was used for LEP and accelerates particles to seven times the energy as uh, the Tevatron. So um, those accelerators that I've just been talking about, they were all built for particle physics research. But nowadays, accelerators are actually used in many other fields apart from particle physics. They're used in material science, chemistry, and uh, biology research. For example, um, like Vicky was saying, in uh, X-ray scattering and neutron scattering experiments, even here on site. And I think you'll all get a tour around one of those facilities today. Um, they're used in medicine for producing isotopes and for radiotherapy. They're used in industrial processes um, including iron implantation, which is the central step in uh, creating all of the chips that go in smartphones and computers. And they're even used in archaeology to help us find out more about the history of artifacts. So even though they were initially developed 
to answer what seems like abstract questions in particle physics. They now play an extremely important role in uh, many different aspects of our everyday lives. Thank you.